Just go by the name of Bitcoin. Huh? Blockchain technology. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, so, but go on, go on. What's a distributed ledger and what's it for? Well, it's a way to uh, acquire consensus on certain transactions in a, without having a central authority vesting those transactions. It's a distributed algorithm so with stateful, stateful updates that need to happen in the same order every day. Okay, so Can you acquire consensus on the order of the operation. Oh. Okay, and the idea is that for some reason, I want there to be a list of things where everything is assigned a number. <coughs> And I didn't totally understand the cryptocurrency use case. Like why, so and it's decentralized because we're not sending it to some one computer, we're having a bunch of computers decide. Okay, okay. And that's the reason that it's a total order, the reason that the fact that it's a total order is important is why? Um. Isn't the order of it yeah. uh, incorporated into the yeah, I don't think it's the best that when you send it over, I mean, it's nothing more than a footing of a paper. Right, but so, but, but yeah, but right, but so, but for this application, isn't it the case that I want to only be able to write two using the hash of one and three using the hash of two? Like, isn't the important property here, sure, total order is great, but isn't the important property here irrevocability and immutability and anchoring for in the history of all the things that happened before it? Does consensus help us do that? Well, I don't know if it does. But we can imagine using consensus and a bunch of cryptographic techniques to establish a chain of transactions that preserve interesting properties like money doesn't disappear, it can only move from one account to another. And dollars can't, for a very short period of time, become two dollars and get spent twice and things like that. A lot of the problems in this domain that you keep Keep teasing me. <laughs> are very interesting, but have, but have very little to do with consensus. It really would just be the ordering. But it certainly is true that people are looking at uh, dusting off some old Byzantine fault tolerant consensus algorithms in, in the context of blockchain to avoid this, to avoid these insane proof of work strategies. Right? Okay. So, what else? Algorithms. Uh, can you be more specific? Uh, um, yeah, if you apply or if you apply, apply operators or operations, operations or state updates to variables over time, you want to be able to at least guarantee if you apply them in the same order everywhere? Yeah, so I mean, that almost sounds like, uh, that almost sounds like for data replication, right, okay. right, which as we learned, Establishing a total order over the operations, the reads and the writes, is sufficient to ensure strongly consistent data replication. Um, and in fact, we looked at one replication protocol in particular that would appear to require <coughs> something like access. State machine replication, right? Where like you have all these replicas and then orthogonal to the replica and the dissemination is somebody choosing a total order of things. And so remember, you know, we said that R1, R2, R3, right, and then there's the client. Remember, the client was going to ask an ordering oracle, which we just said, oh. Well, let's not say that anymore. Instead of saying that, let's say PA1, PA2, PA3. There are three machines doing proposer acceptor, et cetera. And so when the client says, give me a note, let's imagine that they've already prepared something, so we're in phase two of multi-paxos. Right? The client says, give me a number, please. And it says, yeah, sure, let me you know. Sure, you can have number one. And then remember that we go down number one in case one of these replicas crashes, etc. Then this client sends out to all the replicas x equals one at number one. And the replicas respond, and everybody knows what to do. Right? So that is the reality of what state machine replication would look like if we wanted to avoid having a, uh, a single point of failure in the order. Right? So pretty much every time I've drawn a no, in this class. A practical application of Paxos is to expand that into a cluster of nodes doing Paxos, acting like a single server, assigning a total order based on arrival time. Right? Which means we can just keep turning the crank on this. What else? What else would you use consensus for? Like what protocols have we studied that aren't 
really satisfactory without consensus. And then I kind of hand wave them. Yeah. Will it be quorum replication? Well, quorum replication actually isn't going to require consensus. <coughs> or it's sort of yeah, like it's a, in some sense, it doesn't always necessarily guarantee consistency. Yeah. They're saying really important. What, what happens in primary backup when the primary fails? Right. It's going to be something that's going to be different. <coughs> Right, so who does the picking? Primary. Some consensus machine to yeah. Yeah. Remember, remember, when we, remember when we studied this business? We said, okay, the primary, right? And there's like, let's say, two backups. We said that everybody has in their mind this idea that there's this view, V1, which says P is the primary in this view, and V1 is in a backup role, and V2 is in a backup role. And then, we said, P, P fails. And we want to advance to a new view atomically, in which maybe B1 is now the primary, and B2 is playing the role of that. You all remember studying this, right? And so let's just imagine that there was a thing that, first of all, allowed us to do these atomic transitions, and also a thing that allowed us to decide that P had failed. Well, why wouldn't that also be PA1, PA2, PA3? And you can imagine, you can imagine the failure detector component being implemented by these servers or even as a separate server. So the failure detector is just this goofy guy who occasionally suspects a process of being crashed. And he doesn't know. The process could be crashed, it could just be slow. So what F does is if, if he hasn't heard from P, now imagine P's heart beating F, much as P1 was heart beating P2 over here. If F hasn't heard from P, it doesn't know for sure that P is going to get back. But what it can do is it can propose to this cluster of accesses, I would like to propose that P is down. Right? And F will either get consensus on that or fail to get consensus on that. But if he gets consensus on it, then these three servers, now we can tolerate the loss of two servers and still remember what our decision was, right? So then F can say, okay, now that we've gotten consensus that P is down, I would like to get consensus about the view change from V1 to V2, right? Now the view change we've got consensus on, and the view change can be disseminated, right? So it gives us a fault-tolerant way to implement just about every oracle that we've put on the side of the protocol so far in this class. Yeah. So is that basically doing leader elections with Paxos, or? Well, so this is an interesting one. So you could certainly use Paxos to do leader elections, right? You could say, I'd like to propose that I'm a leader. And then either, they either agree that I am or they don't. Um, Unfortunately, you couldn't use that leader election as an optimization for Paxos because you get into a turtles all the way down kind of situation. I did earlier in this class indicate that the problem of failure detection is very much dual to the problem of leader election, right? That like, uh, tell me all the processes that are down as opposed to choose a process that, that isn't down. So sometimes what this thing is doing is the mirror image of leader election. Right? Yeah? In this case, would you use F as a like a proxy to P so that the client would always know how to, would always be able to get the leader. Well, see, in general, that shouldn't be hard because our assumption is I just understood your question. Let, let me come back to it in a second. I, I, I find it perfectly it's in my brain. But um, wait, and then the second question was what? Sorry. <laughs> how would the client? In this case, how would the client decide uh, who? Because started? everybody knows the view, right? The view has been disseminated to everybody. And so, and we went over this before, but I'll say it again because it went fast. If we imagine that the client is in the same administrative domain, right, the client's in the data center, right, it's an application server, then probably we would just make sure that we disseminated the view chain messages to the client too, and the client knows everything. But if the clients are clients like on your laptop, and there's millions of them, it doesn't make sense to have your laptop absorbing these view chain messages all the time. However, if the client talks to, he just needs to know the identity of any of the servers, and the server can tell them the view. Right, so it might take one more hop to say what's going on out there, who the hell's the primary. Okay. Or you could do forwarding. All those things are already described. Uh, and then, yeah, so I understand your question now. What you were asking, but I didn't understand, wasn't like, is leader election happening over here, but is like the result 
of this protocol execution essentially doing leader election in the sense that this one is becoming the new leader. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And it's like a totally safe leader election, which is guaranteed to never have a false positive where there's two leaders at the same time, which is fine in Paxos, as we saw, but will be catastrophic in primary backup. So primary backup requires that there's never two primaries. Yeah. So in the in, in this situation where X comes to consensus with PA one PA two PA three, that P is down. So is the consensus protocol that you're using? It is using back. Is, is the um, or after <laughs> in the prepare phase when F asks PA one, I propose that P is down. How does PA one respond? Does it respond? I reject your proposal if it knows P to not be down. Oh no, no, it wouldn't be anything like that, right? Unless imagine F is the only thing that has any knowledge about who's up and down. The only, the only thing the PAs are here for is to durably and fault tolerantly agree about the fact so that we can lose some of them and remember who we think is down. Right? So F would be saying, first of all, it wouldn't be saying anything about what to accept in the prepare phase. Let's imagine the prepare phase is done. It's the accept phase in which it's saying what to accept. And from the point of view of the consensus algorithm, as I've tried to indicate, these are just arbitrary values. We don't care. We have one job, and that's to accept one of them. We don't weigh in on which one we prefer. It, 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 hugely in contrast, right, to two-phase commit, where the agents get to weigh in on whether they can do the thing. Right, in Paxos, all you have one job, and it's to decide. Um, so, so these things wouldn't have any opinions about who was up and who was down. The only reason they would reject something is because they had accepted something else. Yeah. So a client of a Paxos cluster is like a proposer, not an, accept, not an acceptor. You know, in a, way. a client like of that, a, a Paxos. Proposer. No, I mean, a client of a Paxos cluster is no more a proposer than a client of primary backup is a primary. Okay. Clients direct their requests to a proposer. Just imagine there's a client out here who has a proposer to say X, and then the protocol begins. Just in the same way that the client forwards a request to a primary. The client isn't the primary. Yeah? So in that scenario with the primary backup supported by Paxos, what happens if there is some kind of partition between the backups, and they, the, a majority agrees on the new backup to be the leader, but then the agreeing majority crashes. Well, if a majority of servers crash, <coughs> like you're saying, so this backup is sequestered, nobody can talk to them. We decide they're down. Then these two servers go down. <coughs> is that what you're saying? Well, in, in the Paxos protocol, a majority have to be agreeing on or the majority have to agree on. I thought you were talking about majority with respect to the primaries and backups. Are we talking about majorities with respect to the primaries and backups, or majorities with respect to the Paxoses? Uh, to the Paxoses. Uh, okay. So where's the partition? Uh, if it happens to be so, if a majority happens to agree on something. Okay. So for example, a majority have agreed that P has failed. Okay. Right. What now? What's wrong? So. Who would they notify that, that that P has failed? Well, they would tell everyone. They would tell the backups. And attempt to tell the primary, but of course it would fall on dead ears if P had failed. Right? They would tell everybody. Okay. Okay. Before you do anything else, change to this view. When you're done changing that view, start accepting new messages. Right? Now we know that if there's a partition in primary backup, primary backup can't go up. But the expectation is in the presence of this gadget, if there is a partition, F will attempt to pretend that the partitioned away nodes are actually dead and make progress without them. And if they come back, we can shun them because we've all agreed that they shouldn't be there. Okay. We've all agreed that although they are there, they're not in the current view. So they don't get to vote. Oh. We don't care. Right? That's what the view kind of means, right? These are, this is the person who you should direct your rights and reads to, and this is the person that you need acknowledgments from. Make sense? So that's huge. Because right? like in some sense, until we got to this point, all that stuff we studied before wasn't much use, right? Because it's like primary backup. Why would we do stuff on more than one computer? Because we want to be able to survive failures. Okay, here's a uh, pr protocol that does stuff on more than one computer. Oh, by the way, if there's even a single failure, it locks up and doesn't do anything. That sucks, right? You need the view change. Without the view change, it's nothing. Yeah. Could uh, PA one or two or three take the role of the failure inspector? Sure. That's what I had said before. Was that they could all be playing the role of F. Maybe it's easier to model F as like a separate process that can come and go that's ephemeral. Who cares? It doesn't need any state because all state of, uh, of reference is here among the, uh, the acceptors. But absolutely they could. And in practice, in practice, it's very often the case that there's going to be replicated systems that are just a bunch of nodes doing practice. 
you know, and saying, hey, please, please pull this. That's like another version of replication that we, we, that we, could, that we could dream up that we, that we don't bother studying in this class. Right? Where everybody is just doing taxes and being a replica that stores data. Yeah, we already picked up that that was slow, right? It's well, it's, it's slow unless you can make sure that everybody directs their stuff to one replica. Right. Okay, let's talk about full consistency. I mean, I, I think I know the point that I want to make, and I think I can make it pretty succinctly. Um, but I just want to kind of connect in your minds in the lecture, even though it is in the spec. Everything we've said so far about causality and what it means as a measure of consistency in the context of rewrite storage systems, right? So we study causality a lot. We have this intuition for causality in a great many contexts. We looked at delivery protocols, we looked at consistent snapshots, in a great many uh, contexts, causality is like your touchstone for the system makes sense to an external human observer. If the system respects causality, things make sense, according to some definition, makes sense, and if it doesn't, they don't. But in order to understand what it means for a particular type of system supporting a particular set of operations to be causally consistent, we have to answer two questions. What are the operations that need to be ordered under the Hazard formulation? And the intuition should be it's going to be the operations that have an effect on the system. The effectful operations are the ones that need to be ordered. The side effect free operations don't need to be ordered. And then we have to answer exactly how is visibility constrained or restricted, right? And we need these two pieces to talk about causal consistency. What are the operations that we're talking about the order? And what are the things that we're not supposed to show a user or something external to the system that would violate our notion of having to be Right? So like, you know, if we're doing causal broadcast, the operations are <laughs> broadcast that we want to order with respect to each other. And the visibility that we should restrict is the delivery of broadcast, right? We have to order the broadcast, and we have to only deliver broadcast in orders that are consistent with happens before. So, but in a key value store, the currency is going to be different, the operations are going to be different, and the visibility rules are going to be different. What do you think they are? What do you think the ops are? Remember, I said only the effectful operations need to be different. So it's just the rights. So in some sense, instead of saying, like, fuck you, Alice, is an event that needs to be ordered with respect to boss smells, we're saying like an operation like x equals 1 might need to be ordered with respect to an operation like x equals 2. I want to know if one could have been a cause of the other, right? So the operations we care about are the rights. They're the things that we want to tag with causal information. But in terms of how do we provide consistency, rights aren't visible to anyone. So we can only observe a causal consistency violation in the context of a read, right? Reads must return data. I don't want to write out the thing. That is colloquially recent enough with respect to my history of past reads. Does that make sense? If I read a particular, so let's say there's this operation x equals 1. It makes sense to, 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 to talk about this as a particular version of x. We'll call it my x v1. If somebody comes along and like reads x v1, and then they write y is 1, call this y v1, we can say that x v1 happened before y v1, right? I might not have written this particular version of y had I not read this particular version of x. And that implies that if somebody comes along, maybe on some other replica in which this data is slowly trickling or something like that, right? And reads 
y d1, and then request x, they better damn well not read a version earlier than xp1, say xp0. And that's what causal consistency is. That says if I request y v1 and then I request x, and xv1 happened before yv1, you better give me a version of x at least as recent as xv1. And I don't care what else you do, but you better do that. Make sense? Yeah. What if we return a version of xv2? Is xv2, because does it subsume xv1? Is it causally later? Uh, yeah. Then that's fine, sure. Then that's fine. Yeah. I said at least as recent yeah. as. Yeah. There wouldn't be any, there wouldn't be very many practical ways to prevent that unless we had what's called a multi-version store right. where we keep around old versions, right. which is a neat trick that we probably won't get into in this class. Uh, I think uh, I think that's time. I understand that, that there was a lot to unpack in that five minutes, so you know, uh, you know, I'll be on the outside.